Time is a social institution and not a physical reality. There is, in other words, no such thing as time in the natural world, the world of stars and waters and mountains and clouds and living organisms. There is such a thing as rhythm, rhythm of tides, rhythm of biological processes. But time as such as a social institution. Uh, in the same way that uh, language is, that number is, that concepts are, and all measurements, inches, meters, lines of latitude and longitude, all those things are social institutions or conventions. The word convention from the Latin conveniri, to come together, to agree about something, to hold a convention, and thus, of course, uh, in its deteriorated sense, when we say of something it's purely conventional. That is to say, you needn't take it seriously. Now, of course, are we going to take time seriously? That is the big question. And it depends what you mean. If you don't understand that time is a convention, of course, you take it seriously. And you are driven by time. Time is money. Time is of the essence. And we do, don't we, live in a culture or a complex of cultures in the Western world where we are literally driven by time. If you read a book like Jules Henry's marvelous work, Culture Against Man, he documents in the most extraordinary way to what an extent this particular culture is driven. So that even the psychologists have altered uh, the word, the old-fashioned word, instincts, and now they call them drives. Because there's this feeling, you've got to make that deadline. There's something there you've got to get to. And people feel driven even when, um, supposing uh, that something's going to happen. You've got an appointment coming up. And some people find that in a strange way unsettling. They are so either eager to make this thing or so anxious about it that in between time they can't do anything else. They're incapacitated until it happens, until the blessed event or whatever it is occurs. But in the natural physical world there is rhythm and there is motion. And time then obviously is a way of measuring motion by comparing motion with some sort of constant. Now the constant in the question of time is a circle marked out in 360 or 60 degrees. And that is time. We cause a hand, a pointer, to revolve around that circle at a regular speed, and that gives us a constant with which we compare all kinds of motions and rhythms. And so the clock is just like a ruler and is as abstract as a ruler and must be taken just for that, which means in a way not seriously, you see. That doesn't mean, of course, that you say, well, from now on we are going to melt down all clocks and use them for something else. Because conventions, social institutions, are very valuable. Corresponding to the watch, there is the compass. And that also is a circle, divided four ways, north, south, east, and west. The Buddhists speak of ten directions because they have not only the eight points of the compass, but they add to that above and below. And in their mythology, they have guardian kings whose duty it is to guard the ten directions. And you see them at the entrances to temples and places like that. All a fearsome aspect. The cosmic traffic cops. 
who are that fierce and are that firm about it all, because it is, after all, important that I can meet you at four o'clock in the afternoon at the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. Because if we couldn't make that sort of agreement, that sort of convention, we couldn't convene. And insofar as it is important to us to meet, uh, we require these sorts of compasses and timers in the vast emptiness of the cosmos. But we must recognize that these things are, as it were, written across vast emptiness. The ground of being, as Tillich calls God, has nothing in it where you can stand. You can't catch hold of it. You can't describe it. But you can imagine all sorts of things in it. Indeed, perhaps the whole physical universe is such an imagination. But don't take it for being ultimately real. There are, of course, sort of gradations of reality. One could say the clock, the lines of latitude and longitude, are, and words and things like that, abstractions, have a rather flimsy kind of reality. Next in order will come, of course, what we call ordinarily the physical world. We say, well, that's material. That matters. And so it has a little harder kind of reality. And uh, most people stop there and they think there's nothing uh, at a deeper level than that. And that's simply because of the limitations of man's att of consciousness, of his conscious attention. Conscious attention uh, is so uh, worked out that it tends to ignore all constants. In other words, when you move from the Middle West and come and live in California, at first when you get here you think, oh, this is a fantastic place, see? It is so beautiful and so lush and so on. And you stay here after a while and uh, in a few years you start taking the place for granted because it's a constant stimulation of consciousness. Also, for example, when you're listening to recorded music, there is always a kind of electronic hum. But we screen that out and ignore it. And so it becomes unconscious. Well, so in a similar way, there is what you might call a continuum, a something or other, in which all physical phenomena exist. And uh, you ignore it, unless in some way or other you can make it hum. And so various practices, like uh, performing yoga exercises, or Zen meditations, or certain kinds of chemicals, can cause your entire sensorium to hum. And this draws your attention to the ground, the background, of everything that you're perceiving, which you ordinarily ignore. I think there is going around an entirely new religion called Hum. And uh, Hum uh, has no organization, no hierarchy, no doctrines, only music and ritual. And uh, just Hum. If anybody asks what's it all about, they say, well, come and see. <laughs> come and hear. Come and Hum. <laughs> uh, that would be kind of nice to have something like that. I don't know whether it exists or not, but it ought to. But at any rate, the, the, the continuum in which everything occurs is, of course, basically what you are. Only because we get absorbed in details, we, do, we forget all about it. Deep down, far, far within yourself, you know very well indeed that you are that. And that what we call consciousness and unconsciousness, coming and going, life and death, are changing uh, modalities within this uh, whatever it is we are. And your identities come and go, your forms, your bodies, your this, your that, it's all oscillating like everything oscillates. 
It wouldn't harm if it didn't. And so, though we are, each one of us, uh, all this cosmos and all this universe, its ground, we don't know it. Because we can't make it an item of knowledge, a particular, and we think the only kind of knowledge there is, is knowledge of particulars. A logical positivist will argue this to the death. And say, well, uh, because your, your thing that is common to all makes no difference. It's true. In a mathematical equation, you cancel out as irrelevant terms uh, that are equivalent on both sides of the equation. You remove them as redundant. But, you know, uh, these things aren't redundant. While it's as perfectly true that a statement about the ground of being is from the standpoint of formal logic quite meaningless, it makes an enormous difference to the way a person actually feels and behaves, whether he's aware of the ground of being or not. So the ground of being isn't a logical proposition. It enters into human life as an extremely vivid experience. And the difference between a person who sees that and a person who doesn't is quite startling. They behave differently. It may not be the way you want them to behave, but it's sure different. And uh, so it's like being in love. It's quite unreasonable to be in love. But when you're in love, uh, you're entirely changed and you behave differently, even though you may be crazy. So, uh, so certain crazy things like being in love or like being aware of the ground of being are immense factors in human life. Even though from the standpoint of academic philosophy and the kind of a scientist, scientific, uh, I won't say scientific, I want to say scientismic kind of phony science. They don't, they, they, they shouldn't be matters of scholarly attention. Nevertheless, they're tremendously important. So within this enormous so-called void, call it void not because it's um, nothing in the literal sense, but because you can't pin it down. But you can experience it. And you, when you do experience it, you wonder why the devil you didn't see it all along. Because it was so obvious. Nothing is more obvious than this. So within that void, you see, we set up these two great circles. The time circle and the space circle. And we notch them all the way around. And we use these concepts, in, which are really in our heads, as constants by which we regulate all sorts of events. Now then, when you lose sight of the conventionality of these things, because you are absorbed in details and have become unconscious of the totality, you begin to invest emotions in them. You may, for example, go to a game of some kind, football, basketball, or to chess, you know, and you watch the game. And you know it's only a game. At least that was what you understood when you went in. But as it progresses and you become more absorbed in the back and forth of the game, your emotions begin to be affected. And you start uh, cheering for one side or getting, uh, want to take the part of the underdog. <coughs> or something of this kind. <coughs> and that's what happened to us when we were born. We got into a gaming room. And we, uh, we, uh, it was only a game, but uh, we begin to take it all terribly seriously. And each one of us is given a part in the game. And uh, people tell us who we are, We're from babyhood up. They say, this is the way you are. It's not like you to do a thing like that, you see, as your mother says to you. Because she establishes an identity for you. And this identity is something you have to make, because you've got to amount to something. You've got to be someone. I mean, as if, <laughs> of course, in the beginning, I suppose, really, we are nobody. But that 
simply means no body. Um. <laughs> and, uh, but we are persuaded all along, uh, and all through life, we begin to build up this precious identity, which is our part in the game. It's like uh, you're playing black, I'm playing white, or you, you, you're diamonds, I'm clubs, or whatever it is, you see. And so we get a tremendous emotional investment in this identity. And uh, it's fortunes on a kind of game, you know, like uh, the old-fashioned snakes and ladders when you land on a certain square and you have to go back and so on. All this absorbs us. And then finally we discover that the props that we've all put together to constitute this identity are wearing out. And we're not able to keep up this identity. And gradually we get old and uh, we begin to fail. And then there's all this thought that, well, it's too bad, it's all over. And because we've got bamboozled into thinking that that's what was really going on. So, one of the greatest hoaxes in this whole thing is the future. <laughs> I don't know why I should be giving a whole series of seminars on the future. But it's important to understand thoroughly the nature of hoaxes. Now, when in talking in this sort of way, don't take me too seriously. Um, I, in all my writing and lecturing, I exaggerate. Because if I don't exaggerate, no one will listen. Because all philosophers who take a moderate tone of voice and say on the one hand this and on the other hand that, and after all we should realize that all points of view should be taken into consideration, one reveres them for their calmness and their fair-mindedness. But when you listen to it all, have they stimulated you? Have they given you a new idea? No. Therefore, to, to teach in any way philosophy, you have to make outrageous statements. But with the warning to your listeners that you're only doing this for effect, to get a point across, to provoke thought. Because my position as a philosopher is not a verbal position. Uh, my position as a philosopher is experiential. And not existential, experiential. That is to say, the experience of the ground. And uh, I will take any side, uh, weave all kinds of, of, of patterns, but the whole point of doing that is by showing you how various opinions cancel each other out. You can come to the no opinion, to the ground underneath, and experience that, which is as good, if not better, than falling in love. So, but it's important then, you see, to understand that to some extent, you see, this is a hoax. That we believe that the future is what we are, what we are responsible for and what we are supposed to live for. And that we say of a thing which we don't think is any good, it has no future. Now when you contrast that which is absolute common sense to most people living in the Western world. It's the future we've got to work for. Contrast that with the Indian, Hindu, Buddhist idea of time. Whereas, we're in which they feel that in the course of time, everything falls apart. And that therefore, there is nothing to be hoped from, hoped for from the future. Now, they would say to us, isn't that obvious to you? Because after all, don't you see that all organisms, all entities whatsoever, fall apart in the end? Some go fast, some go slow. What do you mean the future? Uh, individuals all fall apart, eventually whole species fall apart. Something else comes true. But for each thing that you can consider as an entity, as an individual, as a species... Its future is death. <coughs> and then they say to us, furthermore, you think of time as a progress. 
as something like a stairway or an ascending ladder that goes on and on and up and up. Maybe it has bumps in it where it occasionally goes down, but it's like a graph, you know, of a successful business corporation looks like this. See? That's how they want their graph to look. The Hindu says, this, you're absurd. The very thing you use for telling time is round. Don't you see? It just goes round. And so, uh, look at the stars. Isn't everything going round? Aren't the galaxies going round? It is going round and round. It isn't going anywhere except round. And we say to them, Oh, you poor Hindus. The trouble with you is that you don't have any technology. You have a terrible economy. Most of you are starving. You think life is just terrible. And therefore, you have a pessimistic view of it. Well, that makes them laugh themselves silly. They have a pessimistic view. Well, because the point is, we're not pessimistic. Because we know that the whole thing is a hoax. We know who we really are. And you poor Westerners, you're bug-eyed. You, you rush around with long noses. You have deep-set eyes. And you go poking your noses into everything. You send out missionaries because you are so uncertain of your own opinions that you have to convert everyone else to agree with you. And uh, you're quite mad. But you live for the future. And poor suckers. All you do, of course, by living for the future is you create a great deal of trouble. Because you think you're involved in a process called history. Now here comes the nub of, of, of a very important matter. History. I've uh, had the most amusing discussions with Orientals. And they have really no sense of history at all. Uh, for them, life goes around, and uh, one year is uh, pretty much the same as the next year. There are rhythms of birth and death. There are rhythms of rulers and revolutions and this and that. But they don't, they don't regard it as, as having some important progression in it. They have chronicles. At least the Chinese kept chronicles. But keeping chronicles is like keeping a diary or a daybook. It's a very different thing from writing history, where you're trying to make out some sort of sense in the course of events. Chroniclers just keep the records. And the Hindus didn't even bother to keep chronicles properly. So it's practically impossible to establish the date of a document from India, unless it was quite recent. Because every time they re-recited it or recopied it, they had to update the names. Because uh, the king in it was an archetypal king. And every king is an example of the archetypal king about whom the story is told. All these Hindu scriptures are like our fairy tales. Once upon a time. Who, who knows? When? A million years ago? Twenty years ago? It's all the same. Because the course of events and the rhythm is cyclic. So... We, on the other hand, from St. Augustine was the real troublemaker. I don't really, I'm not absolutely sure that the Hebrews had a linear theory of time. It's questionable. They might have had one. Because they did look forward to the coming of the Messiah, to the day of the Lord, to, they had this apocalyptic idea that they were in such a wretched situation that there was going to come a day when the divine power would intervene in human events and set everything to right and there would be a head-knocking session called the Last Judgment and uh, everybody would be put in order. <laughs> well, but what St. Augustine did with that, you see, uh, he rejected the cyclic theory of time. Not quite so much on account of the Day of the Lord, uh, coming at the end of time, but on account of the Incarnation. He was somehow fixed on the idea that when Jesus was crucified, that was the one full, perfect, sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It happened once. And if time is cyclic, he argued, this would have to happen again and again and again. And that couldn't be. Therefore, there is only one time.
one progression of time, from the creation of the world, through its redemption by the sacrifice of the cross, and on to the, the final judgment. Then time would cease, and we should be in eternity. And from this, theologians increasingly began to think about the historicity of Jesus, and to emphasize that it was a historical fact, and that history, as worked out in the Bible stories from uh, the creation through the fall to the doings of Noah and Abraham and the captivity of the Israelites in Egypt and the giving of the law by Moses, all this was worked out as being the mighty acts of God which revealed the divine pattern for the course of human events. And the funny thing is that although many, many historians living today are not Christians and not Jews and don't believe in anything of that, they still think of history as a significant momentum towards progress, something that our children's 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 children are going to get. We all suffered and lived for them. You're going to inherit this goodie down the end of the line. Now, we really don't know and can't talk about progress unless we know where we're going and are making progress towards that uh, desired object. But most people involved in what they call progress haven't the faintest idea where they're going. I have found increasingly that businessmen and military men are astoundingly impractical. They just don't know what they want. They think they know. I had a long discussion with the Air Force strategic people <coughs> and uh, they asked me and some other philosophers what is your basis for moral behavior? So I pulled their legs and said, the basis for my moral behavior is pure selfishness. A very practical selfishness. So, of course, I am talking like this because you're all hard-headed people. I'm not going to give you any sentimentality and stupid stuff about love and so on. Because you face reality. You're a military man. And uh, you have to see that the, the United States of America, as a collective selfishness, is... Uh, properly looked after. Now, I said, of course, in my own personal life, um, when I'm selfish, I'm not too crude about it. I don't run around hitting people over the head and telling them, uh, gimme, gimme, gimme. I pretend like I'm a public servant, that I'm out for their best interests and uh, all that sort of thing, but that's camouflage. So then I said, now, the only trouble about this is that to be effectively selfish, you've got to answer two questions. The first is, what do you want? And the second is, what do you mean by yourself? Well, you know, that just pulls the carpet out from under everything. Because, <laughs> what do I want? Well, if I answer as a kind of a sensible human being, what do I want in life? Um... The really important thing I have had from the beginning, which is that I'm a, an incarnation of the ground of being like everybody else. That's the most important thing, because you can't get rid of that. <laughs> the next thing is, of course, I want food. I want um, friendship, companions, love, uh, and general singing and dancing and so on. And these are more or less attainable material realities. But then I look at my very wealthy friends who ought to be able to have all these things, especially those who are extremely active in business, and I realize they don't have them. They're the most miserable people. Here, you're a great executive of a very, very important corporation. To begin with, you are drowned in paper. 
You do nothing but scan paper and make decisions about paper all day. You may be the director of an oil company. You never get within sight of oil, except when you drive your car. Uh, mostly, you're surrounded with statistics about oil, finances about oil, and you are smothered in this. And you have to spend almost all day in a wretched office building in a place like New York. You dress like a funeral director. You, uh, I've had lunch at the board of directors of a very important oil company that will, shall be nameless. And it's like eating in a college cafeteria. The food was just, I mean, it was good food. It was extremely ordinary. But you would expect these great millionaires to be having caviar and uh, glorious fish in aspic and wines and beautiful waitresses serving them and uh, to be lounging at tables like Romans? No, sir. <laughs> and then, uh, if you've read an article in Look this week by Marshall McLuhan and George Leonard on uh, sex, the future of sex, fantastic, brings up some information that what they call the narrow-gauge specialized male that is the sort of guy who gets out there and sells, you know, and he, um, he, he, he mustn't have any feelings, because that would be unmanly to have any feelings, except he can have a kind of a gruff, you know. And, but so many of these men are like that. And it says that that role-playing of that kind of male gives you ulcers and uh, all kinds of complaints and is more deadly than facing the bullets in Vietnam. And they all die before their wives because they are engaged in the pursuit of a completely fatuous goal. This fatuous goal is the future. And it is symbolized, above all, by money. They make lots of it, and uh, have it much more than they can even think about. And they have no idea what to do with it, except make more, except invest it in bigger and bigger units of something. And... Uh, while they are harassed about that, and they're wondering about the antitrust boys, the internal revenue, their competitors, and all these ghouls who are involved in the game. They lie awake nights. Uh, they can't go home and throw the whole thing off. Uh, they have to get completely boozed. Uh, that's one way out. Or tranquilized, which is another way out. Or something or other. In order to take it. And they call themselves realists. You see, they're utterly unrelated to the physical universe. Well, this is partly, of course, because of the education they've received. You see, if you go to an ordinary school, such as we've had uh, since the, um, well, the early 19th century, um, you uh, discover that your education is purely cerebral. You are prepared to be an executive, a bureaucrat, some kind of uh, clerk. You know the word clerk is originally means clergyman. Because the clerics were the only people who were clever. The word clever, clear, clerk, cleric is all the same word originally in English. They were the literate people. And therefore they did all the bookkeeping and that kind of thing the records. But they got away with it, you see, and they convinced us that the records and the bookkeeping is more important than the actual goods being transacted. So that now people, uh, you see, are much happier with money than with wealth. Or think they are. Try to persuade themselves that they are. But they bought a lemon. So this guy, who thinks he works for the future, this great captain of industry, condemns himself mostly to misery. There are a few exceptions, naturally. As I said, I always exaggerate everything. I know a few uh, important businessmen who have some conception of how to enjoy themselves. But I was amused to meet a young one a little while ago who <laughs> had created one big corporation which had been bought up by another of the biggest uh, shows going today, 
He was a member of the board of directors, and he said, Now, I'm 35 years old. I made an awful lot of money, and I'm going to drop out. So he took off for India. <laughs> well, uh, then let's go and look. We've had a little look at business. Let's go and look at the, at the military people. And they don't know what they want either. Uh, first of all, they invented a weapon uh, which was completely insane because it isn't a weapon. It's a, simply a contrivance for planetary suicide. And now a weapon is a very specific thing. Now a sword is a weapon. And notice it's pointed and sharp and directional. Because then you learn, first thing you have to know about using a sword is where to put it, where to point it. And so it is selective. But things like biological warfare, poison gas and nuclear bombs are not selective. And you don't know when they're going to blow back on you or which way they're going, what the consequences of them are. The only thing you can do with them is you can pile them up and start playing, lighting matches in the powder magazine. This is a very dangerous game that people might play with each other. Um, well, we're both sitting in a powder magazine, and I dare you to drop that thing. <laughs> or, or, you know, we'll blow ourselves both up if you don't do what I want. Now, this isn't strategy, it's madness. Beyond that, they don't, they, they, they don't have any objective. It would be understandable if we were going to Vietnam because of all those gorgeous little oriental girls. We were going to capture the whole lot and bring them back here. But we're not. We are out to destroy something called communism. And nobody really can figure out what it is. Because if Russia is a communist country, all it is is a one great big corporate business. Um, it's one corporation instead of a cluster of corporations. And uh, it's, it works rather miserably. And uh, I wouldn't think if you, you need to fight it, it would just fall apart uh, because it's so boring. Recently, the Congress of the United States passed an act against burning the American flag. <whistles> Stiff penalties for burning the flag. And those same people who passed that act with a great flurry of patriotic speeches were actively burning up the country for which the flag stands. They are allowing every kind of scoundrelly use of the water, the air, the uh, natural resources and uh, exploitation of the people until the whole thing is being converted into a smog bowl. I flew not so a few days ago from New York right across the country to Los Angeles and from New York to Denver there was smog over the whole country as far as I could see from 30,000 feet. And this is America the Beautiful. You know, you burn up the flag is terrible. Burn up the country is quite okay. Because these people are confused, completely confused, between the symbolic world and the real world. And so, this historical thing, you see, which is a destiny in the future, always being pursued, is completely destructive. Because technology, clocks, instruments, measurements are fine for people who know how to use them, people who know what they want. But for people who don't know what they want, and who think that the clock is the thing, you know, that's what you need. I mean, the Russians are insane about this. The moment they move into a place uh, with their army that is, uh, has some kind of technical civilization, they capture all the wristwatches in sight, and they cover themselves with wristwatches like bracelets. Because they are time crazy too. 
But those things are very wonderful for people who, as I say, know how to use them. Because you can make significant plans for the future if and only if you are alive today and now and know how to live now and know what to do with now. But if you don't, you see, you never will. Because the only, the only time to start living is immediately. Do it. I mean, you, you know, uh, why wait around for something to happen? Uh, let, let's, let's live it up now. Let's have a ball, you see. But we don't. Because we think that if we have it now, something, we won't have it tomorrow. But if you're always saving up to have it tomorrow, you never have it at all. <laughs>